Okay, good afternoon. Uh, after a bit of an absence here, we're ready to kick off again on uh, on our, our Bayesian modeling course here. Uh, let's see, at least one news item here. Uh, you may have seen an email I sent out where I posted some uh, revisions to the handout because um, I've expanded quite a bit on the materials here regarding the use of informative priors. So if you haven't already done that, you may want to download uh, the new handouts for that. Uh, in addition, uh, as you've is probably all too obvious, I'm still quite tardy on getting uh, the midterm posted. Uh, it looks like the way uh, right now we're planning on doing this is I'll go ahead and send out later today uh, a PDF document that'll have the uh, the content of the midterm on it. But uh, Joe just uh, suggested uh, a good idea here, which would be to uh, maybe not put all of the content of the midterm on the uh, on the course website, but go ahead and at least put the uh, essentially an, an I guess you could sort of an answer sheet if you like, uh, so you would actually put the answers um, uh, in. You would yeah you would enter the answers on what amounts to sort of an answer sheet format, uh, but you would use the the PDF document I'll send out for the content of the the test itself. So uh, more on that. Hopefully we can get that all wrapped up yet today so that you can get started on that. In fact, that will kind of serve the role of the uh, of the homework for the week. Okay, let's see. Get some of my controls straight here. Okay, let's get uh, rolling on some content here. Oh, actually, that's not what I wanted to do. Let's change that. Let's go to, there we go. Okay, so uh, for at least for the first part of today, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, the notion of using uh, informative prior distributions as part of our analysis. And in fact, I, as I think I've commented on a couple occasions and will probably remind you on a few others, is, uh, the place where Bayesian methods pay off most is when you are using it to uh, integrate both prior knowledge, prior information about your model parameters as well as analyzing new data and trying to make inferences that is conditioned on both of those sources of information. Uh, let's see here. Oh, I see I do have one question here. Let me see, give a, let's see how long do we have to turn it in, and when will the midterm be? Well, okay, same question. Uh, on the midterm, uh, I'm trying to remember what I posted originally. I believe the uh, uh, the original time course for this was that it'd have to be turned in with two weeks. Uh, I'll give you a definite posting on that. I actually hadn't even thought about it, to, to be honest. Uh, but I think the original idea is that it'd have to be turned in within two weeks. You'll find that the, it's a relatively short one and the, the format is fairly simple, so I don't think that will be uh, onerous, um, at least for most people, to get it in within that time frame. Okay, back to this. Um, so, so, so what I really wanted to do here then is to give you some uh, some ideas on where informative prior distributions might come in on clinical pharmacology applications. And again, that would be essentially be the cases where Bayesian methods would most pay off uh, and where it may be worth maybe some extra trouble in order to implement the things in a Bayesian context. So where might we put them in? Well, uh, there are a number of cases where you may want to uh, integrate some prior modeling results uh, into an analysis without necessarily having to carry forward all of the data uh, when you're doing that. Uh, one place I've encountered where that's been particularly useful is where in the past I've constructed models to describe the relationship between some biomarker and, uh, and some clinical outcomes of one kind or another and have then taken that model, including uh, the parameter estimates that were obtained from some previous modeling effort, and incorporated them uh, into some new work. Uh, and in that case, used not only the model structure, but also brought in the model parameter values and in appropriate Bayesian format, 
uh, did so by means of using informative prior distributions. It also reflected the uncertainty uh, in those parameter estimates. Um, there's cases that uh, we sometimes encounter where uh, we go into some new data analysis situation where the data is insufficient to support uh, a model that we know to be uh, more appropriate for uh, for the particular case but where we can't really estimate all of the parameters based upon the data at hand and a fairly common situation that we encounter that is in population pharmacokinetic applications where uh, we're in later phases where we maybe we've got fairly sparse data uh, and we but in the past we've worked with uh, you know phase one studies for example where it was pretty obvious that uh, you needed maybe a first order absorption component uh, in the model, for example. But when I, and in those contexts, you were able to estimate it fairly well because you had enough samples in each individual to describe the absorption process. But you get to later phases with sparse sampling, and lo and behold, you don't really have enough data uh, to obtain good estimates of KA, uh, and, and you and even less adequate information for supporting things like estimates of the inter-individual variability in Ka. So what do you do? Well, one, you know, a fairly common thing that's done is to use what you know is in some sense a a, a less adequate model, such as just a, you know, just using uh, a model that's actually appropriate for something like, uh, you know, like a bolus IV input or something like that simply because you don't have enough uh, data to support estimation of Ka or in some cases maybe you'll take uh, pr uh, prior Ka values but you just put them in as fixed values uh, and you don't estimate them at all. Uh, neither option is, is very good. Uh, the one where you put in the fixed value of Ka you know, I suppose in some sense may, it makes a little bit more sense, but that doesn't recognize either the inter-individual variability or the uncertainty in those parameter values. Well, if you're working in a Bayesian context, you could choose to put an informative prior distribution for Ka, but use uh, less informative distributions for, for the remainder of the parameters. Uh, and as such, you would have what seems to me at least a more a more reasonable, uh, more sort of objective approach to dealing uh, with that lack of information in the new data. Uh, context where I find the use of informative priors uh, perhaps most powerful and most logical is when we're dealing with so-called physiologically based models or mechanistic models of, of one kind or another. And, and here when I'm saying physiologically based or mechanistic models, I'm thinking of models where the, both the model structure and the well, the, the model structure is based upon physiologic knowledge and the parameters themselves have clear uh, mechanistic interpretation uh, and in many cases can in principle be estimated based upon external experiments uh, things like blood you know things quantities like blood flows or uh, or you know tissue blood partition coefficients things like that uh, where they have where they're directly interpretable as opposed to some sort of uh, rate constants that we often get in uh, simple compartmental models where we can sort of come up with loose descriptions of what they mean mechanistically, but we can't directly tie them to any externally measurable quantities. So in the context then of physiologically based models here, and I'm thinking of both, you know, things like physiologic pharmacokinetic models or where we've seen this kind of thing done with Bayesian methods more often has actually been in physiologically based toxicokinetic models. Uh, is It's been fairly widely used and there's actually a pretty large literature of uh, Bayesian methods applied to those models. Uh, 
And then also, uh, perhaps more interestingly, is to talk about mechanistically based models for, for drug response rather than just drug concentrations. And again, there's some toxicology applications out there. Uh, and I guess probably for most of us on this call, the part that will be more interesting is to consider uh, their use for in drug development uh, or even patient treatment applications. Uh, another area uh, where we may want to use this is in both the design and the analysis uh, of clinical trials. Uh, one of the more obvious situations where we might want to do this is where we use informative prior distributions to either re completely or partially replace uh, control treatment arms, uh, you know, such as placebo arms or active control treatment arms in studies. Uh, and so that's that's one context where it can make sense. So in other words, you've probably heard in terms of trials that use historical controls. Uh, this is, if you work in a Bayesian framework, you can do that in a way that appropriately considers the uncertainty uh, in those uh, historical controls. Uh, in some cases you may be uh, you, want, you may prefer not rather than simultaneously analyzing a bunch of trials, or maybe you can't because you, you don't always have access to all of the data uh, at each step, uh, is, is if that's the case, you could analyze a sequence of, of trials by sequentially combining them. So, for example, you could essentially analyze, you know, you would analyze the first trial, that would produce a posterior distribution that would then become the prior distribution for analysis of a subsequent trial, uh, and so on. Uh, so it would be a way of sort of carrying forward knowledge uh, from prior trials uh, when you're analyzing subsequent trials. Um, let's see, what did I have for the next one? I don't remember what I intended to mean there. Let's see. Oh, okay. Uh, here's where, I, okay, the words I used there were combining prior knowledge about exposure response from existing drugs with data for a new drug candidate. Uh, and there's a number of reasons why you would want to do that, but where it would pay off uh, in terms of making inferences about a new drug candidate is if it shared some characteristics with the previous drugs. So, for example, if it operated by the same mechanism of action, uh, it might be uh, reasonable to assume that they share certain uh, parameters of the model, and so you would be able to use informative prior distributions for that subset of parameters when you do the analysis. Uh, let's see, where was I going with the next one? Oh, okay. Uh, there are contexts where you may want to take prior knowledge that you have about the relationship between some one or more biomarkers and the clinical outcomes of interest. Uh, so you may have constructed previously and models for that relationship uh, based upon data for existing drugs. And you could then, you know, you could then pass that information on in the form of both the model structure and prior distributions for the parameters of that model that you could then use as part of an analysis of biomarker data for some new drug candidate, and and use that combination then to make inferences about clinical outcomes for that new drug candidate even before you've actually observed any such clinical outcomes for that drug. Uh, and that can sometimes be a powerful, uh, a powerful application. That's particularly true in things like adaptive trials, where you may have an adaptive treatment assignment or adaptive dose assignment component to the study, uh, but you may have a situation where the key clinical outcomes or clinical endpoints may take a great deal of time to be observed. Uh, you know, they you know, it may be something that you don't get any meaningful data on those outcomes for, you know, six months to a year, but you might be able to have biomarkers in a matter of days or weeks uh, that you might be able to use to make inferences about what those long-term outcomes are. Well, if, if that's the case, you could base uh, things like adaptive treatment assignments on the biomarker outcomes 
but your decision your decision criteria are based upon the predicted clinical outcomes as part of that. Uh, let's see, and then finally there may be contexts where you want to apply uh, Bayesian methods with informative priors to, to individual patient treatment. In fact, a lot of the classical methods that are used for uh, individualization uh, you know, based upon therapeutic drug monitoring uh, are done by Bayesian methods. Uh, whereas you accrue data for individual for individual patients, you would then use Bayesian methods to adaptable, adaptively adjust uh, the treatment regimen uh, for that individual patient. And the approach there is one where you would use in, initially you'd be using informative priors based upon a a population PK model, uh, and then as data is accrued the subsequent posterior distributions then would provide predictions for uh, for that individual patient uh, and you could do that again sequentially as, as increasing amounts of data are obtained for that patient. So that's just kind of you know loosely some of the the range of applications and what I what I've added to the uh, content here is mainly uh, providing some examples to give you a little bit more of a flavor and to get a bit more specific about some ways we could bring uh, informative prior distributions uh, into our Bayesian analyses. So let's start out with a uh, nice uh, physiologically based PK example uh, in this case. So you can see here this is a case where uh, where you've got a group here uh, Let's see, I think she pronounces her name Georgieva or Georgieva. I won't swear I've got that right. Uh, but you can see we've got a group here, including Leon Ahrens and Malcolm Rowland out of University of Manchester. Uh, they've actually done a fair amount of work on physiologically based PK models. And uh, Leon, in particular, has spent a lot of time looking at uh, Bayesian approaches to a range of models, include, including physiologically based models. Uh, this one, they were creating a um, sort of a case study of sorts uh, based upon uh, diaz diazepam. And now, of course, this is, in some cases, you have to view this as a model compound since it's clearly an old compound, but they were trying to set forth a principle on how you could do this sort of approach where you could. Uh, where we would start working on the pharmacokinetics of an agent uh, in, in the preclinical context and then use a physiologically based model to keep on making uh, forward predictions uh, initially going from preclinical and then phase one, to phase one and all of this is using a, a Bayesian uh, population model here but a physiologically based model for the pharmacokinetics and of course they bring out the notion of using informative priors here. Uh, so this thing is illustrating then the potential for applying Bayesian methods uh, plus mechanistic model to early clinical development. Uh, they've got a relatively complex physiologically based PK model and on the left you can see the uh, the representation here so you've got uh, several tissues here all interconnected by blood flows so you can see the box over here for venous blood another one on the right for arterial uh, you've got blood flows carrying drug into various tissues and I probably won't remember what all his uh, their abbreviations are but I'm presumably MU is muscle um, and I'm, I'd have to guess at what some of these other are LI's got to be liver here and KI kidney uh, I'm guessing RE is the reticuloendothelial system here, uh, LU must be lungs, uh, and so on. So you can <coughs> you can sort of guess some of the others like spleen and uh, anyway if I worked at it we could probably dream up what all their abbreviations are. But it's, it's broken out the various body tissues and organs uh, apart here. So we've got prior distributions for things like blood flows going to the various organs. Uh, there are volumes or weights associated with the various organ systems. Uh, there are probably things like um, partition coefficients, uh, blood tissue partition coefficients, 
again, associated with all of them. The end result is, I believe, let's see, I'm trying to remember, do I have it here? I don't have it here. I believe they ended up using a just a fairly large system of, of first-order differential equations for this. I don't think it got messier than that. Um, so, but anyway, they've got this fairly complex physiologically based PK model. Uh, they use it to analyze uh, some rat PK data. From that, they infer uh, human PK. They make predictions of human PK. Uh, and then finally, as human PK data, data becomes available, they use it to analyze that data. But as they go through those steps, they do not throw away the past. So it's not like every time you get a new set of data, you analyze that new data like you've all of a sudden gotten ignorant. Uh, they, they're carrying forward both the model itself as well as the model parameters as they carry it through. Uh, and then I guess I just pose the questions here about how can you apply such a large apparently over-parameterized model uh, and the argument here is is that you need to combine Bayesian modeling and informative priors in order to make that possible. And of course, I'm missing some important pieces there. You also need uh, the the mechanistic or physiologic knowledge uh, to support both the model structure and uh, and the means for constructing those informative priors. So we've got a model structure that's determined by physiologic knowledge. We've got informative prior distributions for mechanistically interpretable parameters uh, that's obtained from a variety of sources. Uh, some of it comes from, you know, decades of uh, publications that describe a number of the quantities that would be of interest there, particularly those that are sort of general physiological quantities like blood flows. Uh, and then there would have to be preclinical experiments done uh, to characterize things that are specific to particular compounds. Um, so again, we've got physiologic parameters like blood flows and tissue volumes or weights. Uh, and then we've got our drug-specific parameters, which would be things like tissue to, parti tissue to plasma partition coefficients, uh, fraction unbound in plasma, uh, blood to plasma ratios, and intrinsic clearances at uh, limit for elimination organs. Um, so once we combine that, the argument here is that uh, assuming you've done a good job in constructing your model, uh, there's potential for more reliable prediction of human PK than, than just empirical allometric scaling methods. Uh, you can, where are we going, the posterior predictive distributions that you get out of here provide a clear statement of, of not only the predictions, but the uncertainty in those predictions. So it, it reflects your state of knowledge here. So it's not a single point estimate that leaves you wondering, okay, I've got a point estimate, but you know how likely it is that the real value is going to be near that. You have a prediction that's telling you something about how likely it is to be near your predictions. Uh, and you have now a model and a modeling strategy that allows you to continuously update uh, your parameters as human data becomes available. Okay, let me take a quick breath here. Let me just uh, see if see if there's any questions before I move on to to the next example. Okay, well, let's see. I'll go ahead and get started on the next example. Uh, the next one I was going to look at is a what I've labeled here as a physiologically based toxicokinetic example, which is it's also going beyond just the kinetics of drug exposure. We're also going to be talking about uh, effects resulting uh, from the particular chemical of interest here. Uh, and in particular, looking at uh, using a physiologically based toxicokinetic model as part of the process of assessing cancer risk uh, for a particular compound, in this case, dichloromethane. <clears throat> 
Uh, and you can see the citation for this one here. This came from a paper that uh, Johnson and Johansson uh, had uh, put together here, uh, looking at uh, dichloromethane here and the cancer risk associated with that. So the objective then is going to be to estimate the excess cancer risk as a function of exposure to inhaled dichloromethane. So, and we'll abbreviate that as DCM through most of this. Uh, some issues or considerations that are part of this is there's very limited data regarding blood or organ DCM concentrations or regarding cancer risk in humans as a function of DCM exposure. Uh, there's some knowledge that DCM carcinogenicity is related to metabolic activation mediated by glutathione transferase theta-1, which we'll just call GSTT1 in here. Uh, and there's some genetic polymorphism in GSTT1 mediated metabolism here. And, and presumably that might result in some uh, polymorphism in the, in the cancer risk also. The approach that the authors took in here uh, involved Bayesian modeling, again using a physiologically based model uh, for looking at the toxicokinetics. Uh, so a similar idea to what we saw with the diazepam example, they would have put this information together based upon general physiologic knowledge and in particular we're going to be considering animal to human extrapolations again so we need to understand physiology of both the animal models and and humans here and have some model describing the interrelationship between uh, what happens in uh, in the humans and animals in here so it's going to be built up and for the most part the model is going to be based upon analysis of of animal data for the bulk of it uh, we're going to have some prior distributions for our model parameters uh, that's going to come again from our knowledge of animal and human physiology. There's going to be some in vitro, uh, ex vivo, and animal experiments uh, to pick up uh, some of the parameters, particularly some of the drug-specific uh, quantities within our model. Uh, in addition, there was a small amount of previous physiologically-based toxicokinetic analyses done uh, in humans, but it was pretty sparse, so it's it's only going to contribute a fairly a really small amount here. In fact, I, as I recall, the dominant contribution it had was to give some initial idea of the amount of variability uh, among humans, so they didn't have to rely entirely upon the rat data to make inferences about inter-individual variability. Um, so we've got all of that to construct our core model and our prior distributions in here. Uh, then there was some uh, there was some new uh, human data that became available. Uh, there was a Bayesian population uh, physiologically based toxicokinetic analysis of that uh, in here, and that's where the the real core of the Bayesian element came in here is doing that using the informative priors. Uh, the model relating exposure to cancer risk wa was more of an external model that came from other sources uh, in here, but again it included, a, so it included a measure of cancer risk with some idea of uncertainty, and the two models then are combined to construct uh, models for, uh, for, for making predictions of cancer risk in humans. Uh, in this and models which again are not simply saying that the probability goes up by X it's going to say it's going to actually provide some distribution of probabilities that reflect the uncertainty in those predictions but I guess the key here again is that would not have been particularly feasible based upon the particular the very limited amount of human uh, toxicokinetic information uh, in here, they really did need the prior information as part of this to make uh, make predictions with any reasonable degree of precision. And oh, I guess I did have another slide. What have I got here? So, okay, so I guess it was kind of what I was saying. So for this case, the prior knowledge makes inferences possible that couldn't otherwise be done. 
Uh, it illustrated the value of using our mechanistic knowledge, uh, you know, and really combining our mechanistic knowledge, some prior quantitative knowledge, and a l very limited amount of human data to predict uh, our, our chemical exposure in humans. Uh, we've got population models that consider multiple sources of variability, and then finally Bayesian methods to quantify the uncertainty in both the prior knowledge and the resulting uncertainty in our predicted quantities in here, and then the, you know, the predictions and inferences about cancer risk then appropriately considered that uncertainty and variability. Okay, so in both of the, the two cases we looked at, the real core of the Bayesian stuff was still primarily in the uh, measures of drug exposure, even though in the second case we did finally get around to making some inferences about cancer risk. They didn't actually do a Bayesian analysis on the cancer risk. They, uh, they adopted that model from elsewhere. Uh, the next example I wanted to go over is one where we actually carry the Bayesian component uh, on through into the pharmacodynamics, uh, the pharmacodynamic components of a model. Uh, so we've got a physiologically based pharmacodynamic example, and it's going to be a mechanistically based model for drug induced myelosuppression. Uh, so here we've got, you can see our title here, we've got Bayesian population PKPD model for espinosib induced myelosuppression. Uh, by a group, I think, I think that bunch was at GSK uh, in here, so that was published a couple of years ago. Uh, the objective of the work was to model the relationship between espinosib exposure and neutrophil counts. Uh, and the, in, the idea here is then once they've got that model, they could use that to support uh, efforts to optimize the treatment regimens uh, for espinosib. Uh, let's see if I did I give some history in here. Let's see. Uh, well, sort of indirectly, I'll mention that. Um, so the data they're going to be working with here is they've got some phase one uh, data here. It's a dose escalation study in 45 patients. Uh, it involved repeated espinosib repeated espinosib concentrations for 40. Okay. I see. We've got, so we've got multiple concentrations measured for 48 hours after the first dose. Uh, in addition, we've got uh, absolute neutrophil counts, and you'll, I think I use the acronym ANC elsewhere here too for that. Uh, those were measured weekly for three weeks uh, following that single dose. Uh, they've got some prior knowledge here. Uh, there's been a fair amount of work um, uh, largely associated with the Uppsala group here, uh, Lena Freiberg, Mats Carlson, and some other investigators there, uh, constructing uh, models for uh, for describing myelosuppression. And basically, these are essentially life cycle models then for uh, for white blood cell development, uh, and then using those models uh, as a means for uh, for describing uh, myelosuppression of various kinds. So, so, they, so again, they've got a semi-mechanistic model for describing drug-induced neutropenia. Uh, and in that model, uh, sort of the, I guess, sort of the mechanistic part of that semi-mechanistic uh, is there's a component of the model which is thought to be largely drug-independent that's describing our, the life cycle for these neutrophils. And so a subset of the parameters then that are associated with that life cycle then are thought to be drug independent. So it would be logical to treat not only the model structure but also those parameters as information we should be able to take forward for future analyses. So that's going to be the basis for our informative prior distributions here. So the question is then can we construct a model for espinosib induced myelosuppression conditioned on both the new data uh, from that phase one study as well as prior knowledge and how would we go about that. <laughs>
Okay, so we're going to do some Bayesian model modeling here using a mix of informative and uninformative prior distributions. Uh, and of course, what we use, the ones that are going to make informative are the ones we think we know something about. Uh, and then we've got uninformative elsewhere. Uh, let's start with our population PK model. Uh, in this case, it's just you know your classic uh, two compartment model here. Uh, and in this case, we're just going to use uninformative priors uh, in this instance. Uh, I guess we'll just treat this that's all drug specific here, uh, and we're not going to carry anything forward from preclinical uh, data. Excuse me. And then for our population PKPD model, uh, we're going to have our mechanistic model of the neutrophil life cycle that's uh, adopted from the model from the Uppsala group. Uh, and you can see that depicted right here. Uh, so we've got a model, and I'll forget some of the terminology. I guess the PROL, I think, is, I guess that's the sort of the, our proliferative component here. So that's kind of our, uh, you know, our uh, sort of the, I'm trying to remember the term they usually use for those things here. Um, but anyway, these are largely, I guess, immature or in some cases even fairly undifferentiated. Uh, cells in here, uh, which then uh, increasingly mature until finally at the end here we have our circ circulating neutrophils. And it's described in this case as just a catenary chain uh, of transit compartments in here. Uh, in this case, each they all share the same rate constant going from one compartment to the next in there. But those things create uh, essentially a delay uh, describing that life cycle in here. Uh, by the way, I should mention that this is not the only such model for describing this. There are others. Uh, there's one model which is sort of eyes for uh, for use for this application that uses delay differential equations rather than using this sort of catenary chain to describe that that delay in here. But for now, we're talking about using this one, which is just a set of uh, first order transits uh, through these compartments. Uh, and then we have uh, the circulating quantity here uh, influences the rate at which our, uh, our immature cells are, are forming down here. Thus we have an arrow back here. Uh, there's a, a parameter associated with that feedback process over here. Uh, which may or may not be influenced by a drug. Uh, we have, uh, let's see, in this case, uh, I guess for our case here, the drug effect is one which is associated actually with loss uh, of cells from our, from this immature pool right here. So that's where, we, so that's being described right in here. Uh, what else have we got? Okay, we also have, I guess at the end, of course, we have the cells don't live forever, they eventually die off, and that too is described by a first order decline at the end. Uh, but the key point in here is the bulk of these parameters uh, within here are thought to be independent of the drug treatment and therefore are things that we're going to carry forward from uh, prior reports uh, in, a, in a Bayesian analysis, so they're going to be described using informative prior distributions, whereas things like down here, which are specific to a particular drug, uh, are then going to be given fairly uninformative priors. And that's pretty much what I'm saying up here. For drug-independent parameters, we're going to use informative priors constructed from the published estimates for those model parameters. But then for drug-dependent quantities, then we're going to be using fairly uninformative priors in here. By the way, the rest of the cartoon over here, I mean, you saw we've got our two compartment model. This just happens to be a depiction of the fit of the population PK model to the data. This is a depiction of a down here of the fit to the, to the PD component of the model. And this is just showing the plots of our absolute neutrophil counts versus time for what do we got I think three different subjects uh, overlaid on there just to sort of give you some idea of the shape of the uh, of the uh, of the relationship there so you give you give this drug you see neutropenia so the the neutrophil counts fall and then after drug treatment is stopped they eventually recover
Actually, in this case, I guess there's only a single dose. So it's you have the initial fall, and then as the drug exposure drops, you get a uh, recovery. Uh, and then, okay, there are resulting model-based predictions that are going to reflect both the new data and the prior knowledge. And we've now got a model uh, that lets us explore the probable range of myelosuppression that could result from different treatment regimens. So we could take, again, that we've got that, we've now got a model that lets us then make inferences about what happens so we can use it to try, you know, different treatments. And here I've just got a plot here taken from the... Uh, from the publication that just illustrates a simulation for uh, administering the drug, or what is it, espinacid, but 7 milligrams per meter squared and giving it uh, weekly for three weeks. And, and this is just showing then the time course, uh, or the predicted time course of, uh, of absolute neutrophil counts there, and it's actually overlaid on some actual data that had been s generated subsequent to the uh, uh, to that uh, single dose phase one study. And here again you can see here we've got our posterior median, our interquartile interval here, and then a, a 90 percent credible interval about that. Uh, again you could then use that as the basis for exploring a range of uh, doses before you actually administer them, get some idea on what the risks might be, uh, and therefore narrow the range of of doses that you might need to explore in a dose dose finding exercise. Okay, let's see. I think that was the end of that example. Um, why am I so? Oh, I know where we're going here. Okay. So the the next example I wanted to go over is actually maybe take a breath. The, the examples I went over up to now focused on basically constructing PK or PKPD models uh, with the notion you could then use those for predictions of various kind. Uh, where I wanted to go to next is is using those sorts of models in the context of of clinical trials. Um, and where they would come up either in the design or the analysis uh, of those trials, or both for that matter. So the, the situation I'm going to look at here is one where we're going to think about combining some prior knowledge about exposure response uh, from existing drugs. You know, existing drugs could mean drugs that are already in the marketplace, it could mean drug candidates that your particular company might have uh, might have uh, been studying before and now you're looking at maybe a uh, a new candidate uh, from the same platform or some such thing but the idea anyway is we've got some exposure response data from from some previous drugs or existing drugs I guess and we're going to combine that with data for some new drug candidate in order to make inferences about that new drug candidate. So imagine a scenario then where we've got our new drug candidate which shares uh, a common mechanism with one or more of the existing drugs. Uh, let's say it's currently in phase one you know perhaps only in uh, you know in healthy volunteers uh, there's no therapeutically re relevant exposure response information yet specific to that new drug candidate. Okay, but we're in a position where, hey, we want to start thinking about designing, sorry, we want to start thinking about designing, uh, you know, phase two. Um, and, of course, in designing that, we want to make inferences about what the exposure response might look like for this compound. But as yet, we've, we haven't really observed any therapeutically meaningful outcomes for this compound. Now suppose some prior information we do have is exposure response information for some existing drugs. Um, and either because there's already some models that have been constructed for those drugs or you've got sufficient data that you could construct such a model yourself. Uh, from whatever data you've got available. And your objective here is going to be to design an efficient phase two strategy 
uh, whose objectives are a combination of proof of, con proof of concept and dose finding. Uh, so our proof of concept question here is essentially, is there a well-tolerated dose of the new agent that has efficacy that's greater than or equal to uh, whatever key active comparator we're interested in? And then for dose finding, we want to know what new drug dose is equally efficacious to the active comparator. Uh, and, and a related question is, is what new drug doses should be used for patient treatment and phase three trials? Uh, as I say, they're probably related because uh, marketability is likely to require that you have a drug which is as good or better than uh, the active comparator. You need some sort of differentiator uh, anyway, and uh, and that will probably determine at least in part what you would take forward uh, for future development. But the idea is, is we need to uh, we need to design a phase two strategy that's going to answer both categories of questions uh, with good efficiency. So, and the question I wanted to pose then is how can knowledge about exposure response for existing drugs be used to enhance uh, the efficiency and informativeness of your next phase two trial. Uh, the argument here is that such knowledge can reduce the amount of information that needs to be obtained about the active comparator, for example. In other words, you could rely on prior information uh, to uh, to describe that active comparator and thus uh, have to assign fewer patients to a treatment arm that involves administration of that active comparator. Uh, arguably you might replace that arm completely but it's probably a good idea to at least have some uh, some data about the active comparator within the uh, within the trial in case there's any sort of uh, uh, systematic differences between your trial and those past trials. Uh, having some data on on that on those active treatments might allow you to discern that or at least adjust for it. Um, then, what qualitative and quantitative elements of the exposure response models for existing drugs are applicable to your new drug? Uh, an example I pose is that. Uh, Suppose that for the existing drugs, uh, let's suppose that they produce efficacy responses that are described well by a sigmoid Emax model. Uh, let's suppose they all share a common mechanism and are all full agonists. Then you could argue that they would share common values for a subset of the parameters, in particular Emax and maybe the uh, gamma, in other words, the, the exponent within this sigmoid Emax model. Uh, if you're willing to buy uh, that premise that your new drug would share those parameters with one or more of those existing drugs, then you could use that prior information based upon analysis of those previous drugs to construct informative priors for those shared parameters. And in this context, those would be the Emax and our gamma, uh, as well as probably some of the variance parameters within the model. So you could put informative priors on those, and they could be used for analyzing the trial and addressing your key proof of concept and dose finding inferences as part of the effort. Uh, so the question is, well, how much could this buy you uh, realizing you're doing this at the expense of, uh, of some assumptions that could be challenged. But let's see, assuming that uh, the key stakeholders here are willing to buy these assumptions, what, you know, what could you get out of it? Uh, and one way I'll look at this is some work that was done by uh, Mike Smith and Scott Marshall uh, at Pfizer UK here uh, and presented in this paper. Uh, seeing here, uh, so they're describing a Bayesian design and analysis for dose response using some informative prior information. Uh, they did some trial simulations then to optimize a phase two proof of concept and dose finding trial. Uh, and it, at least in a subset of the designs, the 
uh, method of analysis uh, used in formative priors based upon data uh, from a drug that shared the same mechanism of action. That's, I guess that's what that bullet point is telling you. Uh, and in the process then we're using that to optimize sample size and treatment allocation in here. The, the designs for, for what that they presented in the paper uh, is a, they stuck with a fairly small simple set they're looking at. Uh, they were looking at study designs that had just four treatment arms. Uh, they had a placebo treatment arm, they had an active comparator here, that's our treatment four, and they had two dose levels of, of the new drug uh, in the study. And they were looking at sort of optimum allocations of patients to these treatment arms uh, and, and to see uh, what kind of what they got basically from by using excuse me informative priors uh, the model they were using is a fairly simple one it's just it's not even a sigmoid emax it's just an emax model uh, that you see and here's you can see the structure they use so they've got a essentially a placebo response component in here uh, and then it's just a simple emax model uh, with a uh, you know, just a normal residual variation in here. Um, let's see, I guess the base the, or the placebo outcome depended upon the baseline response as you can see here. Um, and there, here you just have depictions for uh, different simulations. These are actually different simulated studies and just showing what the the fitting process looks like for those. So those are just five examples. Or actually, I'm sorry, let me take that back. I just I just explained that all wrong. These are actually real data. Uh, so in this case, um, the, of course, th this was all blinded. They didn't tell us what the indication was. But they have some metric for efficacy here. They've got doses. These are actually five different studies uh, that pertain to the drug they're using as the active comparator. Uh, and they fitted these three studies simultaneously then uh, in order to construct this model and consequently construct prior distributions for, well, they're, they get posterior distributions from this analysis, but they serve as the basis for constructing prior distributions for the EMAX. Uh, and, well, you've got EMAX, you've got ED50 for the active comparator, We've got our E0 component in here. We've got one other little parameter, gamma, comes up. And then we have our, our variance terms. So they're informative priors for all of those components. So we've got, as it says here, we've got prior distributions for our placebo response, Emax, and ED50 for the existing drug were obtained by modeling that data. Uh, then they assigned a fairly vague prior to a measure of relative potency uh, for the new drug. So you can see it's log normal with a median of 1 and a CV of 158%. Uh, so you median of 1. So there, it's centered uh, at, at 1. In other words, the, the center of it would be equivalent to saying the new drug is equal in potency. Uh, to the uh, to the active comparator, but the uh, the CV is broad enough that it's relatively uninformative or at least weakly informative uh, for that new drug in here. So these are uh, some results they had. The upshot in the end here is by using informative priors, they were able to reduce the sample size by roughly half. So, and this is sort of one little excerpt of the results here. So they, because they did simulations under different scenarios, particularly different scenarios as far as relative potency of the uh, the new drug. So the example we're looking at here is the case where the true relative potency is four, uh, and the success criteria they had for uh, for this was that the probability that the relative potency was greater than 1 is 90% or more, uh, exceeds 90%, and that the expected uh, relative potency is greater than 3 in here. So they've done a bunch of simulated trials. I don't know how many replicates off the top of my head, but they would have done you know, several replicates 
of the same trial for the same scenario. And they looked at different designs. And you can see the way the designs vary are in terms of total sample size. So that's what we have in our this one column right here. So you can see they went from around the, what do we get, the smallest of 40 and the highest was 320 in here. And then they took that sample size and apportioned it differently between the different treatment arms. So between our placebo, our two different doses of the new drug, and our active comparator in here. Uh, and sort of uh, the ones I highlighted here, we've got sort of we've got this one row here you can see, which is kind of the uh, sort of the default, if you like, for the case where there's no informative prior used. Uh, so you can see if you've got 80 per treatment arm, that's 320 patients in here. And you can see that under the uninformative prior con analysis that you end up with a 90% probability of success, but at the expense of using a pretty large sample size. Then, and the main one I was bringing to your attention here is this other uh, design here where we've reduced the sample size a sm somewhat smaller amount, uh, you know, a fairly small amount for the uh, for our new drug. So we're going to do instead of 80 per arm, we're going to have 60 per arm, but we reduce the sample sizes for our comparators by a large amount. So we're going from 80 down to 15 for the placebo arm and the same thing for our active comparator. Uh, because we have such strong prior information about those two cases. So we're relying pretty heavily on our prior distributions to replace the inf information we would get. And so we've knocked the sample size down here. You can see to 150. And notice that, uh, now actually I didn't point out before that with the first case where we had 320 patients using informative priors had minimal impact. Uh, on the probability of success here because we already had so much data here that uh, the prior wasn't very influential. But now once we talk about reducing the sample sizes by more than half here, we get roughly the same probability of success as we did back here uh, with our large study uh, uh, when we incorporate the informative priors. But if we had not incorporated the informative priors, we would have had an unacceptable probability of success uh, in here. And you can look through some of the others and see similar comparisons. You can even see one that goes down to 100 here, for example, uh, by knocking the um, sample sizes for our new drug down to 40 uh, per arm and only 10 per arm on our two comparators. And notice that the probability of success is still pretty high, yet it would have been quite small had they, if you didn't use informative priors in here. So the, the point is here is you can markedly reduce uh, the sample sizes in some instances, and thus the cost and duration of a trial by rational use of prior information, assuming you have uh, the relevant prior information. Okay, drink here. Let me take a breath here, see if uh, any questions have cropped up in the examples here. Uh, let's see, one question that came up was uh, asking if reducing sample size is mainly to save money. Uh, there's depends on the context. Um, if you've got a drug where the risks associated with being exposed to the drug are, are low, then I suppose the dominant issue here would be uh, money and time. And of course, the old classic phrase that time is money. Um, you know, so you would like to move on. Uh, and and speed up the development of your drug in many cases. And if you can reduce the sample size, you normally can also reduce the duration since it usually takes you a certain amount of time to recruit patients. And in fact, that's usually the, the bigger savings on this than the cost of actually conducting the study. <laughs> 
in most situations. So that's part of it. Uh, but if you have a drug where, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the other thing you could argue is that, you know, exposing people to a drug unnecessarily exposes them to unnecessary risks, risks either associated with maybe adverse consequences of taking the drug or to being or maybe being exposed to a treatment that's potentially less effective than uh, than what the standard of care is. So again, there may be uh, some ethical reasons why you might want to reduce the number of patients who are actually participating in, in a trial and being administered a, a drug of unknown uh, efficacy and safety. So there's, there's a lot of reasons why you probably want to reduce, uh, reduce uh, the exposure to the drug. Okay, why don't I go ahead and, oops, here you go. talk in some more, what I was going to do next is talk in more general terms about some things you probably ought to be considering uh, when uh, constructing and using uh, informative prior distributions as part of your analyses. Uh, so first let's talk a little bit about uh, the process of constructing informative prior distributions. And there, you know, there's different places that prior distributions could come from. Uh, and and prior distributions may represent real knowledge, or in other cases, they may represent belief. And the end result of either is you end up with inferences that are conditioned or predicated upon whatever that knowledge or belief is in here. So you have to decide whether or not that's really appropriate for a given context. But anyway, let's just go through you know, sort of the, the two main notions to main sort of approaches for constructing priors. One uh, may come from what I termed here elicitation of subjective opinion. Uh, and there's a number of contexts where that may make sense, but I'd argue that for most clinical pharmacology applications that probably has limited utility, shall we say. Uh, and it's not, not an approach I generally recommend for uh, for the, most of the clinical pharmacology situations that we're working with, uh, but the other con the other con context or method for constructing uh, prior distributions would be a somewhat more objective strategy, which is an attempt to summarize external evidence. Uh, by external, I mean external to whatever the source of new data uh, is in a given context. And I'd argue that that's probably the more relevant approach for most of our clinical pharmacology applications. Uh, I wasn't going to go through a detail in any process, but what I do recommend is a little bit of reading that might be worthwhile. And I, I mentioned two articles here uh, that did a nice job on describing the a process of constructing prior distributions for their particular applications. Here we've got one out of Steve Duffel's shop here. Uh, where they had constructed priors by using summary statistics from some published reports. Uh, and then there's an, another paper here by Johnson Johnson and Marshall that provided a particularly good description of uh, constructing prior distributions based upon uh, mechanistic and empirical knowledge in, in the context of a, I think that was a physiologically based toxicokinetic application uh, in that particular case. Uh, but they're both worthwhile to give you a feel for for how you might want to construct prior distributions based upon uh, various sources of information. And let's talk a little bit more about this notion of you know constructing priors based upon by on summarizing external evidence. Uh, and when we do this, we have to think about what is the nature of that external evidence. Uh, and how does it relate to the new data uh, that we're actually interested in analyzing? And in particular, how does it relate to uh, the kinds of inferences we're interested in making? Uh, and one um, in one book here, there's a book by Spiegel, Alter, Abrams, and Miles here that I think I have the citation at the end, uh, the end of the slides there. But 
uh, in their chapter five, they make an attempt at coming up with a uh, a taxonomy, if you like, of of sort of different evidence types uh, and and how they should be viewed and how you might want to consider acting on them when you're constructing prior distributions. Uh, and all of these categorizations, this whole taxonomy is really based upon what they see as the relationship between that prior evidence and the new data. Uh, so you can think of it as being descriptive of the prior evidence relative to that new data. So one category is that that prior evidence is irrelevant to the new data, uh, in which case, well, you shouldn't even use it uh, to construct your prior distributions. Uh, there are other cases where the prior evidence is entirely, they ref use the term equal, I like the word equivalent I guess a little better, where it's equivalent in some sense. This would be the case where you believe the prior evidence or the prior data uh, is really just a random sample from the same population that you're interested in making inferences about and the same distribution from which your new data was derived. Uh, so in that case, we were talking about a situation where the prior evidence, it has the same form uh, and is equally informative about the parameters, your model parameters of interest in this case. Uh, so in, in that case, you can pretty much just use the, that prior evidence then to construct your prior distributions for your various model parameters and use them as priors directly on those parameters. Another category is what they called exchangeable uh, parameters. This would be a case where they might not be derived exactly from the same distribution, but they're sort of like one level removed. You, you know, that any differences that may exist between uh, the nature of those the nature of that evidence and your new uh, and your new data is such that. Well, it's kind of falls under the heading of they might be a little different, but you have no particular reason to believe they are, but you kind of want to hedge your bets a little bit, if I had to describe it sort of um, colloquially here. Uh, the way to probably deal with that kind of information would be to use a hierarchical model in which you might have study-specific parameters that are sampled from a common distribution. So this would be a case where you know, where if I, I'm trying to think of a way to describe this easily for you, um, you know, where, you know, I'm going to analyze maybe the results of one particular study um, in here, and I may believe that this prior evidence I have is was derived from studies that are similar to but not necessarily identical to my current study. There may be some differences, but I don't have specific systematic knowledge that they're somehow different in a particular direction. So I might construct an overall model that would have some sort of interstudy variation in it. Uh, and the previous data would result from one draw from that interstudy distribution, that interstudy variation, and my new study would be another draw from it. So it, it, it explains some possible heterogeneity amongst the studies, but it still provides some information uh, relevant to my my new data. Uh, basically that ends up being a sort of a weaker prior than the one we talked about in the case where it, the data and the prior evidence is uh, you know is is essentially equal or equivalent. Uh, another one they referred to as equal but discounted. In other words that would be sort of like we did with the equal where you would construct prior distributions based upon the parameter estimates resulting from that previous uh, analysis of that previous data, but instead of using the posteriors from that previous analysis as your prior for the new analysis, instead of using it directly, you discount it. And in particular, by discounting, one approach to discounting would be to take the variances associated with those prior, those, well, the posterior distributions of the previous analysis and make the variances bigger. You would inflate them by some degree to reflect some uncertainty in the relevance of that prior evidence. Um, let's see. Another case is where there is the potential for bias in the previous evidence. So this is, and I say potentially, so it's not known bias. It's just that you have some suspicions. There may be some biases 
associated uh, with that, and uh, they argue to use uh, hierarchical models, much like we did in the exchangeable case, to accommodate possible unexplained differences among prior studies in your new data. Uh, and then finally, there's the one where uh, there is a functional dependence. So this would be a case where there is essentially a known bias, or at least a bias in a known direction. So there's, there is, you believe you've got some knowledge, there's some systematic differences between the prior evidence and the new data, and you actually explicitly model uh, that dependence as part of it. So you would actually explicitly incorporate the bias uh, as part of your model. Of course, if that's the case, uh, that means you think you have some knowledge about what that the nature of that bias is. But all of these things are trying to give you some idea again of different con you know different cases where you believe there's some value, uh, some relevance of that prior knowledge to your new data, but there's a range of possibilities here and how you might want to think about it. So some questions you may want to ask yourself when you're starting to think about it, about how relevant or exchangeable uh, is that prior knowledge or data. Uh, so one thing you might want to ask is, okay, let's say that data was derived from various past studies. You might want to ask, well, are those past studies really exchangeable with the new ones? Or should the past information be discounted in some way to account for differences? And as I put there, this could be known differences of some sort or unknown differences and more often than not they're they're unknown uh, you know so you may want to ask questions like well first of all are the patients comparable you know what you know are you know and there are a lot of things that might cause those patients to be somewhat different maybe different entry criteria for the studies maybe the studies were conducted in different geographic areas where the um, you know, where the practices may be somewhat different uh, in there. Um, you know, between when, you know, when and where that previous study was conducted and the one that you're going to be doing, uh, has the standard of care or measurement changed uh, between those two contexts? Uh, certainly, if you look at a number of diseases that we may be interested in finding treatments for, uh, you may often find that uh, the standard of care has changed, and uh, you know maybe maybe when some of those previous studies were conducted, there was there was no effective treatment available, uh, so the studies were often you know placebo uh, controlled studies with uh, little or no concomitant medication being given as part of it. But now maybe there is a standard of care out there. Um, maybe there you're not, you know, maybe if it's not even ethical to do placebo uh, controlled studies anymore. Uh, and maybe it's not, it's not ethical to do studies where you study monotherapy compared to the standard of care. Maybe you can only look at add-on to study of care, uh, standard of care, things like that. And those things can change over time and they can be different over different geographical areas. Uh, in here, so you have to look closely at whether or not, again, that that prior data or prior knowledge is really relevant uh, to the new context, uh, and and maybe you think it's relevant, but it's likely to be biased in a certain direction because of these differences, and then you have to ask, is there a way I can sort of compensate uh, for those differences? Do you have some knowledge about in what direction things may have changed? Uh, or things like that. Uh, another question is, is if you're using published information as the basis for constructing your prior, um, is there a risk of significant publication bias? And if so, do you understand what direction the bias is likely to be in? Is there enough information maybe from things like funnel plots or something like that that might allow you to even get some sense of the magnitude of that bias? So the ideal, of course, would be no bias, but if you think there's a significant risk, if you can get some handle on the potential magnitude, you can incorporate that uh, within into your prior uh, as you're constructing it. But again, those are all the things that you need to sort of think about 
uh, is you're going to use that past information. And they're the very kinds of questions that tend to come up uh, when, uh, when you're trying to, well, when these models get challenged, uh, particularly if we're talking about using them in the context of clinical trials. Um, some things that you should consider doing as part of a critical evaluation or sensitivity analysis uh, when using informative priors is you really should have some sense of the relative influence of your new data and priors. Now, there's when you're using informative priors, you're probably using them for a reason. You expect them to be influential on your results, at least to some degree. Um, you know, so it's not a bad thing that it's influential, but it's a good idea to have some idea of what that influence is and how sensitive your inferences are to that. Uh, and that may well be key to, to defending uh, any inferences you're attempting to make. Uh, and so part of this is you want to know what the robustness of your key inferences are to those priors. And if not, you're going to want to make sure that your priors are, are, are defensible. Um, part of this is in a lot of contexts we're trying to help an organization make decisions. Uh, things like, you know, uh, go-no-go -no -go decisions or dose selection, things like that. Uh, and, and so there's usually the decision is not entirely ours to make. There's usually multiple stakeholders and more often than not some in positions of greater authority than you are relative the de to the decisions to be made. Uh, so you need to be able to to convince them that your recommendations are appropriate and in doing so you're going to have to consider the beliefs, knowledge, and values of the key stakeholders and the decisions that are being made. Um, when you're doing these analyses. So you want to ask yourself questions like, you know, is the prior distribution acceptable to the key stakeholders in those inferences and the decisions that result from the analysis? Uh, and, you know, and things that you may want to consider doing uh, in order to make a strong case uh, based upon the work you've done would be to do things like, uh, you know, in addition to maybe constructing a prior based upon your best scientific uh, knowledge and, uh, you know, and research, uh, it may also be a good idea to construct uh, a prior, you know, priors in a couple of, couple of ways in order to, uh, to work with some key stakeholders. One would be to try and construct a prior by some sort of consensus uh, that considers uh, the values and knowledge of that uh, of the key stakeholders in this. Uh, one term that I've seen that uh, that I sort of liked here is this notion of a community of priors. I took that from the publication mentioned down here, but to actually consider a community of priors. In other words, don't do the analysis only based upon one set of prior distributions, but actually consider multiple prior distributions so you could and in fact that could serve as your primary sensitivity analysis here which is to do a sensitivity analysis to explore how the inference changes for different priors that are preferred by particular stakeholders so if you have some individuals in, in the group that are challenging your analysis based upon your choice of prior distributions uh, to the extent you can, try and get them to indicate what sort of prior distributions, you know, would they find plausible. Actually do the analysis using, uh, using those choices and, and assess how that influences the inferences. In some instances you get lucky and, uh, and the, you, you end up where the, at least the qualitative aspects of the inferences may not change that much and the decisions that need to be made may not be altered much by that, by their, by their choice of priors, uh, in which case the problem is solved because there, it, it shows them that their criticism, uh, is not so much that it's unfounded, but it, it shows them that it, it didn't have an impact. Uh, and that even if they preferred to condition the inferences on what they believed instead of what y you argued for, it didn't make a difference. 
Uh, in other cases, it does in fact make a difference and that puts you in a position where if you still want to make your recommendation based upon your original choice, you may have to construct a essentially a stronger argument and, and bolster up uh, what your prior distributions were based upon. Okay, that was the end of the discussion on use of uh, of prior uh, or of informative prior distributions. Uh, again, I'll take a quick breath here and see if there's any questions before I move on to a completely different topic here. And I guess if, by the way, if there's you know, if there's some uncertainty in thinking about sort of the mechanics of some of this, uh, I guess the one thing I'll mention is when we do move on to our next major hands-on example, uh, we'll actually illustrate uh, the process of using some informative priors in that case. Uh, the other thing is I definitely encourage you to look at some of the references that I cited here uh, for some of that. Okay, well, I'll keep my eye open and see if anything else pops up here. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to go to a, uh, now for something completely different, as someone once said. Uh, let's talk about uh, a somewhat bug-specific uh, issue here, uh, which is the use of something called the cut function, uh, which is uh, a function that's built into uh, built into bugs to uh, to accomplish a particular task. It, it could be done in other thing in other software too. It's just that it has this particular name in, in bugs. Let me see if I can get get across the notion here and why we would want to use it. And this particularly crops up in the case of uh, PKPD modeling, but I can imagine other kinds of situations where you might have multiple kinds of observations and a model that has multiple components there are reasons why you may want to some degree separate inferences across some of those model components so anyway so right now so let's start out with this notion that uh, I'm sure many of you have dealt with situations where the issue came up of okay I've got to do uh, PKBD modeling Okay, it involves a PK modeling component, and it involves a modeling component relating the PK to the PD. And should I do it sequentially? In other words, should I do the PK analysis of first, then basically lock those parameters in place, and then use the predicted concentrations from the PK model to do my PKPD modeling? Or should I just do the whole thing in one go? where I simultaneously model both the PK and PD. And there's been both papers and a whole slew of uh, NM users uh, uh, threads and things regarding this issue. And there's a number of philosophies out there for why you might want to do one versus the other um, in, in these things. Uh, so I'm not going to sort of recapitulate the whole thing, but the issue comes up not just in uh, in the context of a say maximum likelihood or least squares analysis. It's also going to come up in a in a Bayesian framework in here. Uh, I guess I often find that the note the the notion of using sequential PKPD modeling can make sense in contexts where where maybe your PK model you believe you understand fairly well uh, and and you're fairly confident that the degree of model misspecification is minor but where there's much greater uncertainty in the model for the pharmacodynamics and in those situations the there's a high risk that model misspecification in the pharmacodynamic model could cause some strange effects upon the fit to the PK data if you try to model these things simultaneously. So the sequent by doing the analysis sequentially, you avoid that sort of feedback of PD data on the PK fits uh, in here. So the same rationale applies uh, 
when we're using when we're doing the analysis in a Bayesian framework. So here I'm going to argue that it's reasonable to use this cut function to permit feedback of our PD data uh, to the PK model in here. So if we normally if we were to do uh, do a simultaneous fit to both the PK and the PD data in our Bayesian framework, the both the PD data and the PK data would influence the PK model parameters. And if both models are sort of uh, are you know sort of equal in quality, if you like, uh, that's probably a perfectly reasonable thing to happen because under those circumstances the PD data may actually contain some information about those PK parameters that you want reflected. Okay, uh, but again there's context where that might not be true. So where I might want to use the cut function that would that would prevent that feedback from the PD data onto the PK model parameters, uh, that would make sense again if the PK model was well characterized by the PK data alone and you know and I felt there was relatively small risk of of major uh, model misspecification in the PK model uh, but that I felt there was substantial risk that the PD model misspecification would cause inappropriate effects on the posterior distributions for my PK model parameters uh, so so if that's the case I can argue for okay well maybe I do want to cut that feedback process uh, in here but now if I if I do now I could still do sort of like what is often done in a maximum likelihood context where we just do it completely sequential where I just do the PD model or do the PK first uh, do that and then move on and do the uh, do the PD analysis using point estimates from the uh, from the PK model but if I do that then I'm neglecting the uncertainty in the PK model parameters which is which to me does not make a great deal of sense in this analysis uh, they are uncertain and and that should be appropriately reflected when I do the analysis of the PD data so if I instead if I do a simultaneous analysis of both types of data but include the cut function to prevent the feedback from the PD data to the PK then the uncertainty in the PK model parameters is still appropriately considered in fitting the pharmacodynamic data but the pharmacodynamic data does not feed back onto my PK parameter estimates um, and, I'll give, and I'll show you in more give you a little a more specific context and what that looks like when you put it in a model in a second here. Uh, if you did want to read more about sort of the underpinnings of this, uh, though the cut function has been in WinBugs for pretty much for almost from its inception, I think um, it wasn't well described in their in their documentation, and, pro and the best description by far is a paper that David Lund finally put together uh, and published in uh, in Journal of Pharmacokinetics and Pharmacodynamics uh, last year, <coughs> and I cite that here. So that's that's definitely worth a read. Okay, so how do I actually use this thing if I want to accomplish this? Okay, so here I'm showing uh, an excerpt from a PKPD model. So I'm not showing the whole kit and caboodle here, but I'm showing the context of where I'm using it. So imagine these uh, our, our dots here represent where we've done our you know our sampling from our distribution for inter-individual random effects in there. So I've got some theta here which has my parameters. I guess I just remind you we're using the here I'm showing it in the context where we're using our bugs model library stuff. So this is like the the hands-on three example we did before. So we've got all the other covariates and so on over here but we've got our model parameters which are uh, subject specific here uh, going into this I'm gonna get my PK predictions so first here I've got my uh, uh, the amounts and all the all three compartments here from our two compartment model now I'm gonna have my loop over my observations here I've got uh, well, I'm actually jumped down here. So for my PK observations here, I've done it like we did before, where there, I'm using the log transform data. 
uh, and using a log normal distribution then for describing our concentrations. In here, this log C hat is related to my second compartment amount and my s central volume of distribution here. So that gives me my C hat. I guess I needed a thing to take the log of it here before it got there, but you got the idea, I hope. Uh, so that's my PK down here. So, so this is going to be for my observed, but then this is my model predicted, which is what I want to use to drive my PD model. Uh, for the example I've shown here, I've got a, uh, a simple Emax model. So you can see my for my pharmacodynamics here, I've got my E hat, my expected value here. So I've got just E0 plus my Emax component over here. So you got our EC50. And where I have concentration, notice that I've wrapped that concentration inside of the cut function. So that shows up in both places right here. Okay, so that cut function then is going to prevent this likelihood right here for the observed effect from influencing any parameters that determine C hat. Uh, so that'll create that cut process, but the C hat values here are still going to still be influenced by the uncertainty in all the PK parameters. So that's still appropriately handled in here. So, and, and again, this likelihood is just as it's done before. So here you can see how the cut function uh, comes into this process then. In this case, I was able to use it fairly simply by just sort of wrapping the... Uh, uh, the predicted concentration because that's the value that fits into uh, fits into our, our PD component of the model. So that's that's a simple illustration of how it would come in. Now again if I didn't do that, if I just put C hat in there, then the observations here for the effects would influence the PK parameters. And again whether or not that makes sense depends in large part upon essentially how much you believe in this uh, this Emax model and the extent to which you think it may suffer from more model misspecification than the PK model. So that's a somewhat subjective choice there. Okay, and what I'm doing here, that's... Well, actually, first let me see if there's any questions on that. Okay, hopefully I didn't leave people too much puzzled by that, and it'll get more concrete when we actually incorporate it into um, into an example that you get to work on. I'm debating on how far I'm going to get on the next topics here. Um, let me see how far I can get you on this. Maybe what we'll do is I'll introduce you to the concepts, but we won't do the demo, because there's no way I'd get the demo through in the in the time we've got here. Uh, and of course then we'd probably have to restart it the next time anyway so let me just give you some initial exposure on the idea and we can revisit it again next time because what I want to go into now is recall that we did we did the bugs model library uh, we did our the last example we did use the bugs model library but we used one of the built-in models but of course that's kind of limiting that only covers your one and two compartment models with or without first order absorption so what do we do if that those simple models don't do the job? And so that's where I want to go to next. And with Bugs Model Library, you can do uh, you can program your own models. Uh, and there's sort of two categories of such models that I listed here. Uh, one category is uh, general linear compartmental models. Uh, and in this case, uh, if they are linear compartmental models, the user then uh, just specifies the non-zero elements of a rate constant matrix. In other words, you would write 
uh, your model in terms of a, in terms of you know your rate constant so you've got a you know a typical model you could write out you know is say the uh, I don't know if I can write this well here it'll be a little squiggly here but you say like X representing the amount in the compartment X prime would be the derivative with respect to time you could write that in terms of a matrix K yeah I can't write for beans on this but we'll see here okay times X in other words the amounts in the compartment where K is then a matrix so X could be a vector then uh, you know which would have a number of elements equal to the number of compartments in here so like for a two compartment model with uh, bolus input uh, X would be a, a vector of two values similarly X prime would be a vector of two values and K would be a two by two matrix then describing the uh, intercompartmental and uh, as well as elimination rate constants into that. So we would be describing that. There also might be a, I guess I'll just describe it as F here. There also might be some function describe a multi, uh, a, a vector valued function describing inputs into those compartments as a function of time as part of this. So you can write that out. But if K uh, is nothing more than a set of scalar values for each one of those components then in other words they're not functions of time then you can specify this so so what you would be doing here is the user has to specify any non-zero elements of that K matrix in there uh, and then the resulting linear ordinary differential equations that come from that are solved under the hood using matrix exponential methods for doing that which generally are going to be speedier than using more general uh, ODE solvers but then if you do have a model uh, that requires more generality in particular if there are any nonlinear elements in there we do have some gen more general ODE solvers built in so I just label those as general compartmental models uh, now it still requires that we're talking about a system of first order ordinary differential equations. Uh, the user then has to program uh, those ordinary differential equations and then they are solved using either a runga kutta method or an adaptive multi-step method, this LSODA, which is, let's see, that's a Livermore solver. I'm trying to remember what the rest of it here. I have to go back and look. I forget what the whole acronym stands for. Uh, but LSODA is a nice multi-step method that also can adapt uh, depending upon whether or not uh, the equations are stiff. It attempts to di discern whether the differential equations are stiff or not. Uh, if they are, it uses one particular method, and if they're not, it uses a different method as part of that. Uh, in both of these, the user has to specify the uh, the model specific quantities either that rate constant matrix or the ordinary differential equations in a template component Pascal procedure uh, that has to be compiled using the black box compo component builder and whether you know it or not you've actually got all the you've got the black box component builder uh, as part of what I had distributed there's um, uh, there's that under program files you'll see that folder called black box win bugs that is the black box component builder in which I've already installed both win bugs and the bugs model library so you've got all the pieces you need component Pascal is the language in which uh, win bugs is written it's um, uh, it well, I don't know how many of you know what Pascal is. Pascal is a programming language that's been around uh, for quite a while and has kind of much like other uh, programs like C, which is more, you know, which has uh, evolved into C++ and Fortran, which has continued to evolve over the years. Uh, Pascal has also evolved into this component Pascal, which has a uh, fairly rich set of object-oriented components in here. Let's see, I do see another question that escaped me before. Let's see. Let's see, it says when using a one compartment model, if I put amount as milligrams and dv as nanograms per milliliter, 
Can I also scale theta 2 as 1 over 1,000, the bugs model script, to get the volume as liters? Well, I'd have to show you the specifics, but usually the simple, there's, in fact, I think, trying to remember which example I gave you actually did do uh, essentially that uh, when I put it together you, you've got you there's several places that you can either do it at the level of changing the amount that you put in or you could do it subsequently but I uh, I always hesitate to try and uh, remember exactly which thing I'm multiplying by a thousand or dividing by a thousand without actually looking at it and, and checking but certainly you can always deal with the uh, uh, the unit conversions either before or after uh, let's see here. So, okay, so we're going to let me show you a little bit more here. So, let's specifically look at our linear case. That's probably as far as we'll get today then. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, programming a linear compartmental model. So, again, that's a model then described by a system of first order differential equations with. Well, it's actually what I was going to say, constant coefficients. It's actually sufficient uh, in the way the thing is programmed that they be piecewise constant. But for the most part, let's just say constant coefficients. So again, this is kind of what I was trying to write on the other page. I should have waited till I got to this page, okay, where K here then is a matrix. So X is a vector of the amounts in the different compartments. X prime is the derivative of those amounts with respect to time and K then is going to be a matrix in here. Uh, and the example I give here is what K looks like for our two compartment model with first order absorption. In here, well that's going to be, we've got three compartments, so X is going to be a vector of three values, and K here is going to be a three by three uh, matrix in here. Uh, so you can see that written out right here. You know, you got your absorption compartment associated with the first column. Uh, you've got your central compartment with the second column and then finally the uh, third column associated with the peripheral compartment. I mean the way you can translate this if you like then is is uh, if you have X1 representing the amount in uh, in the absorption compartment then X1 prime will equal minus Ka times X1. And similarly for our X2 prime would equal Ka times x1 minus the sum of k1o plus k12 times x2 plus k21 times x3 and so on. So that's how the again how the matrices relate to the individual equations. Um, so that's so the user then is responsible providing all the values for the non-zero elements. So the user has to assign values to all of the components here I'm out underlining right here uh, as part of the code. Um, and as I say mentioned before, when this is method is applicable, it's usually faster than trying to use something like the Runga cutter or the LSODA methods. So if you do have a linear compartment model, it generally makes sense to make use of this approach. Uh, here what I've done is given you an excerpt then of the component Pascal code for that two compartment PK model. So we're taking this model now and coding it in this page. I've marked in red uh, the lines the, the user would need to change. Now the rest of this uh, that's written are all, is all necessary, but the approach that I provide you with here is I give you the template. I give you a template where all the rest, the stuff that's in black you can think of as being uh, uh, you know, is really being uh, boilerplate that you don't normally need to change in these things. But the red parts are the parts that you would need to change. Uh, what you're going to be working with is the the bugs model library function that you're creating. Uh, from bugs, it's going to pass that theta vector. So you can see I've got that right here. So for any given individual or at any time point, it's going to pass a vector of theta values uh, in this case and here I'm assuming that they're going to be ordered as I've shown them here so that uh, let's see how did I oh, okay here I'm assuming it's actually written in terms of the 
micro constants as opposed to like clearance and volume. So you can see here I'm assuming they're being passed here as K10, K12, K21, and Ka. And you can see here I've here I'm doing, by the way, this part where I've given them names, that's only for readability. I could have actually done all the assignments over here uh, up on the top using thetas, but I find it more readable to first do these assignments. So here you can see K10 equals theta 0, K12 equals theta 1, and so on down the line here. Uh, and then finally, I have to create, I have to make assignments to the non-zero elements of this matrix which internally here I called K matrix. So this K matrix 0, 0 corresponds to this value right here. The first, what in, when anything other than the Pascal world would be K11. Uh, but it's going to be called K00 inside uh, that. In fact, let me mention that right now. When you're doing Pascal programming, matrices, uh, the first index of a matrix is the zeroth uh, thing. So indexes start at zero instead of one. So the first thing you need to do is sort of translate that uh, and think they always start at one. So what we would normally call theta one is going to be theta zero inside here. Uh, so you have to keep that in mind. Other uh, bits of syntax to keep in mind is notice that this is not an equals, it's a colon followed by an equals. So that's the symbol for assignment. And all statements end with a semicolon. So those are just uh, some Pascalese elements that you need to remember. So that's why you see here K10 is not, uh, it does not take the value from theta 1, it takes the value from theta 0, and so on. So we've got four elements of theta, and they're all going to to the various k's here, so but they're numbered from 0 to 3. Then finally, similarly on the matrix, each index on the matrix begins at 0. So it goes from, so our 3 by 3 matrix, instead of going from 1, 1 to 3, 3, goes from 0, 0 to 2, 2 uh, in here. Uh, so you can see anyway, so again, we've got minus ka, so that corresponds to that element there. The second one here, you can see the K matrix 1, 0 going to Ka. That's our element right here. So that's the, uh, the f that's going to be the second column, f first row. Or I'm sorry, second row, first column. So again, what would normally be K21 becomes K10 uh, in Pascal in here. And similarly, we've got our 1, 1 which actually corresponds to this element right here. And there you got our minus K10 plus K12, and so on, until we fill out all the non-zero elements. Uh, any of the zero elements you don't need to worry about because it starts out by initializing all the elements to zero anyway. Uh, the other bit of bookkeeping that the user has to do for Bugs Model Library is you have to tell uh, the program how many uh, total parameters there are, and this includes the uh, the F and uh, and T lag parameters in here. Uh, so you're already, because it's three compartments, you've already got six parameters right there. So you've got six, uh, So because you've got three Fs and three T lags, and then you've got four more parameters to make ten, so that's why it's ten. Uh, then you have to tell it what is the index associated with the first of the F parameters. Uh, that's going to be, notice that here theta, theta goes up to th the third one, so the next one is going to be 4. And that's the for F1, and then for T lag is uh, normally going to be however many compartments there are, plus this one, so that's why you have 7, because it's 4 plus 3. You get 7, and the number of compartments is 3 in here. Um, Let's see, what more do I want to tell you about that? That's pretty much it in terms of the coding that the user has to do. Uh, let's see. I think to actually show you the real nitty-gritty, because uh, uh, actually what I will do uh, here is we won't do the real nitty-gritty this time. We'll start out there uh, in our next session. In fact, we might actually use part of the lab session to do this. Um,
Let me show you uh, a place that sort of gives you the step-by-step -step instructions. Uh, let me shrink that and pull up. Okay, this is the user manual for Bugs Model Library in here. And let me scroll down to, not the installation part because that's where it starts. Let's go down to where it talks about using it. Okay, well what, it, what you'll find in here, it first talks about the simulated examples that are, that are going to be used uh, to illustrate the use. So it goes through a description of that. Uh, and I'm not going to agonize over that now. We'll spend a little time on that next time. Uh, it talks about our compartmental models. Da -da 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 -da. Where did it go? Uh, general. Okay, so this is where I wanted to get us here. Uh, you'll see where it starts talking about the general linear compartmental models in here. Uh, if you start, first of all, you're going to want to read some of the stuff before that. You don't necessarily need to go through the installation, but where it starts talking about use of the, um, of the model library, I would start reading there. But then come down here where it talks about our general linear compartment models. It's going to repeat some of the stuff we just talked about. But then what it does right here is it gives you a step-by-step -step set of instructions on how to actually implement uh, a new model. And uh, in our current version of this, you can see it's a little bit tedious. Uh, plus, I was maybe being a little overly detailed on some of it. But uh, there's a number of steps you have to go through to actually use, uh, use the Bugs Model Library to create your own. But anyway, I would recommend before the next meeting here, it would be worth actually uh, looking through this. So even if you don't choose to sit down and try and do one of the examples, because that's basically what we're going to do in the next session anyway, uh, is at least read through this to have some sense of what the process looks like. Uh, and we'll actually step through it next time. And in fact, every time I look at this list here, I remind myself that one, my, one of my biggest uh, items on my wish list for changes in the uh, Bugs Model Library is to create a tool for, uh, to some degree, automating this process. Because right now there's a number of steps in this process that would be automatable. So the user should be able to just specify the, uh, the model functions and then push a button to deal with the rest of it. But we haven't done that yet. So we'll, we'll still put you through some extra effort to get the actual model done. And let's see, is there anything? Yeah, and the, actually what we're going to be doing the next time is actually stepping through uh, the example that's cited uh, in this section here where it talks about example 2, general linear compartmental model. So we'll be, we'll, I'll be illustrating that. And in fact, the next time, um, actually for at least for the next lecture section, we'll also be going through the more general case of dealing with potentially nonlinear compartmental models. Okay, um, that's actually where I think where I'm going to stop it here. Uh, remind you again, I will uh, post. Hopefully, it'll be posted today um, and, or at latest tomorrow. Uh, the stuff on our our midterm exam. Uh, I've got the questions already, but we haven't set up the infrastructure yet for uh, for putting the uh, the answer sheet and stuff within the. Uh, uh, within the the course uh, website here so that's kind of the next step to be done and uh, hopefully that'll all be wrapped up and I'll give you details and put a, an official due date and all that stuff in there uh, for dealing with it uh, let's see in the meantime I guess I'll see if there's any last questions before I vanish okay so far nothing popping up there so uh, I guess till next time uh, have fun with wind bugs. We'll talk to you then. Bye now.